Thanks, and we appreciate you subscribing to the Clive Barker Podcast. In episode 268, Jose and Ryan break down the, and discuss the 34th revelatory interview. That plus the new Candyman trailer, there's a poster for the torturer, and the Brass Bushido configuration box video should be out. Uh, welcome, this is episode number 268 of the Clive Barker Podcast, and I'm Ryan. And I'm Joe. And uh, this is a news episode, so um, we will be covering, I guess, well, first of all, uh, this one has not gotten nearly as much attention as the previous trailer, but there's a new Candyman teaser trailer. Yeah, yeah, it uh, came out recently, so if you're probably listening to this on on Sunday, the 5th, by the way, happy July 4th. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this one came out on Universal Pictures' YouTube channel on June 28th. So it's yeah. uh and even when you search cuz like I I remembered I'd remembered seeing it in you know on paid Facebook pages and stuff and then mm-hmm. I went back for this to prepare for this episode and and that previous trailer with the shadow puppets or not shadow puppets but the, the with the puppets that mm-hmm. was all over the news everywhere and this particular trailer is not so much so it's a little harder to find, but we've got a link to it in the show notes, and it's only 30 seconds long. It's definitely a teaser, but it, it, it makes a sort of interesting premise that it, he says Candyman's not a man. Uh, Candyman is the whole hive or something like that, right? And uh, the idea is that the, the, it, he's like a, a combination of this, uh, of this racial injustice, you know, uh, piling yeah. up and boiling over. About all these stories that we saw on the uh, pa- uh, paper cut puppet video, yeah, um, that these stories that keep happening over and over. I think the guy says he's not a he; he's the whole hive. That yes, uh, yeah, which, which may be like a play on B and he, but anyway. So it's uh, it's got the 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 painter uh, played by Yaya Abdul Mateen, and I think he's talking to the other actor played by Coleman Domingo, who you may recognize from Fear of the Walking Dead. Um, yeah. And he is – Coleman Domingo plays the character who gives him all the information, all the exposition about Candyman. At least that's what uh, it seems to be from all the trailers that we've seen so far. He's like the guy who's talking to the, the young painter who's obsessed about Candyman. And he's mm-hmm. telling him that it's, like you said, kind of a projection of all of this racial tension and all this racial injustice. And if, um, you, if you ignore it, if you don't believe it, then you get the Candyman. That was kind yeah. of that was kind of the what I took away from it, and I think that's kind of ingenious, right? I mean that I, that's uh, that even goes a step beyond what the original Candyman film, you know, did is uh, talked about as far as like racial injustice and racial inequality. Um, this is taking it even a step further, right? Because in the first one, the racial injustice and inequality was displayed through the fact that it was. Um, a white academic woman going into a, a the projects basically right the yeah. woman, Cabrini Green yeah and and talking to people who are in a, in a completely different world uh, both culturally and economically and um, and the, the thing about Candyman in that movie the Bernard Rose film is that uh, in my opinion they t- they addressed it like how uh, urban legend spreads right like mm-hmm. urban legends but in this case it's more like the I think in in some ways it breathes a little more from the actual original story where it's like it's this anxiety and this belief and this faith and this uh, something bigger and that what, gets together and creates Candyman. It brings him into existence. And the, and keeps him alive, right? The, the rumors and, yeah. the, you know, keep him alive. And, and, uh, and if there aren't rumors, he's got to do stuff to m- bring the rumors back. He's got to you know, appear and kill people. Yeah. It's a manifestation of this sort of like vengeance of, you know, enough of this, you know, that's going to, Candyman is going to show up and he's going to set, I don't know if he's going to set things right, but he's definitely going to get some revenge on the situation. And it's, it's really interesting. This movie that started before the death of, of George Floyd. Right. And, and, uh, and, but they're making it, they're, they're, it's, it's taking on this different tone of, you know, it's almost like sort of a Black Lives Matter um, premise where the the violence is 
is bubbling up and starting to or the the tension is bubbling up and starting to boil over and if you ignore it then um yeah then then the bad stuff happens yeah i mean it's been going on forever yeah. <laughs> it's well, before no, that's george tr- floyd yeah that's true that's yeah. true but it's even more more poignant now because it's uh now it's right. in the streets you know now yeah from the Emmett Till, Eric Gardner, you know Michael Brown, uh, uh, Tamir Rice. Uh, yeah, it, it's just the list goes on and on, right? Yeah, it's just terrible. And so it was always there for for Nia DaCosta and producer uh, Jordan Peele to pick up this this angle for the movie. Yeah, and uh, you know you know Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, you know all these names it's been going on for a long time it's yeah. been going on since america was you know a, a big slavery country that uh built cities and harvested crops and did all sorts of things on the backs of slave work uh not just black but also you know uh asians and and you know even irish people got the bad part of the stick when they when they got off the boat they were being given basically like a a ration and a uniform and say, sign up here to join the army and we're going to yeah. send you over to the front lines and uh, you're going to be cannon fodder. So, yeah. Did you know during World War II, this this is history that they never taught because it was embarrassing, but there was a, um, there was a unit station in England uh, of the, of the U S army mm-hmm. and the, the U S army tried to force the local restaurants and businesses to segregate, really, and, and, I had in no idea. Eng- and in England they said no, we don't, we don't do that, and and they said, well, you have to, and in, and then um, England said, well, no, we're not going to do that, and then so they, they said they started making blacks only businesses and blacks only restaurants so that the U.S. black soldiers could go and mm-hmm. uh, and not have to worry about being forced out by their white, uh, you know, coworkers or whatever. I didn't know that, but I'm not surprised. And, and then the military police got involved, and we had a war between our own soldiers right there in this little tiny English town. And yeah. and they said like, and there were like seventeen uh, seventeen people died on the 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 black soldiers side, and they they didn't wow. have their guns; they had to go buy them from the British town. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I just had read this. Somebody posted this story that you know had been sort of covered up. In, yeah, uh, in well, the U.S. history, segregation in the armed forces didn't uh, really officially end until President Truman uh, abolished, uh, wiped out segregation in the armed forces in 1948. I was just yeah. looking at at something that you were talking about, and uh, that's crazy. That was it. Took three years until the war, World War II, was over to end segregation in the armed forces yeah. officially. Yeah, and, so, and, and you know, and it's like, geez, why? You know, why is it's so crazy that they would, they would make that hill to die on? You know, when they're out, they're in another country. They should just be honoring the the customs of those people. Yeah, it, yeah, it's 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 a strange time that we're living in, but it's also inspiring time because it feels like uh, maybe because of this whole COVID thing that people have been. You know, tensions have been boiling, but also people have had a lot of time to just stay at home and and focus on things uh, about their lives and 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 the lives of people around them. Yeah. And I think that this whole thing that was sparked with uh, with with uh, not just George Floyd, but uh, but other people, um, this is a time when. When people are protesting, and usually when uh, there's a time of unrest, it's also a good time to change the paradigm. Yeah. So I think that it's it's um, like I, I was telling my wife the other day about the Mississippi state flag having the uh, that element of the rebel flag in it, and yeah. I was like, I don't think they're ever going to change that. Even now with this whole thing, I don't I don't know how they could change that because it's Mississippi. Yeah. And we just lost our audience in Mississippi now. But I was like, that's never going to happen. Yeah. And then two days later, oh, the Mississippi legislator is going to change the flag of the state. And I'm like, yeah. huh, wow, I am pleasantly surprised that uh, it, at this it, time of, of unrest that they actually, you know, managed yeah. to, to get that overthrown. It's really interesting. And, and 
and people are are uh, I see that you know from the from the the right wing side on Facebook, people are kind of bringing up like Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben and saying, "Oh yeah, you know all those liberals made a, a victory." And and but I thought that those companies are kind of making those decisions themselves about their own branding. I don't think it's pressure from from anybody in government. Nobody right. nobody's coming down on Aunt Jemima at this time. I mean, that's not really something that that's uh I mean, yeah, it's it's a little uncomfortable, but that's not something that's But that's definitely not, that's the, not the racial protests, violence, right? It's just a syrup bottle. Well, but definitely the changes in the air and they're picking yeah. that up and they're using it to change their marketing. Yeah. Um uh, and, and it's beneficial to them. That's the reason that they do that stuff. Well, yeah, it's it's kind of like they're 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 protecting their brand. Uh, yeah. there's a there's a lot of greed behind that. It's just a, a way of protecting themselves. Like the Land O'Lakes uh, butter uh, Native American woman was removed as well, and oh, now the yeah. Land O'Lakes doesn't have her anymore. It just has lakes and a landscape. And um, yeah, you know, people are saying, and, and oh, you know, Washington, you're facing history. Washington Redskins are on sort of on the brink of changing their name. Yeah, they that. Those have been on the brink of changing their name for years now, and nothing has happened. Yeah. But again, this is the probably the right time for that change to happen, um, just because the change is in the air. And this is a time where we have to grab onto that and and push a little further, tip it over, and 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 you know maybe progress will yeah. take one step forward. But uh, you know, if if you're angry about this, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, but we live yeah. in a democracy, so things will change. Uh, yeah. The whole idea of you know, there is there is fiscal conservatism. There is social conservatism. The idea of conservatism itself, to me, just seems like it doesn't take into account the way the society changes. Um, and I say that in the sense that you know, in the world that we live today, you have you have to change things. You know, you have to change yeah. things because Gen X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. That that's seventy. Three to like 1990 or something. I don't know. Anyway, so yeah, we're Generation X. So our parents lived in a world that was pretty much the same for a long time. I mean, there were some wars and stuff, but socially speaking, there wasn't a lot of radical changes in the way that their grandparents live, our grandparents lived, and our parents lived. Yeah. Uh, unless we're talking about ec- economical changes, but society-wise, it was pretty much the same. But since we Started growing up and becoming adults, I, I just feel that we've come to terms with uh, a lot of ideas that, hey, society may not be put together in the best way. Maybe there's things that we should change. Uh, maybe it's not – maybe there's it's not a good idea to preserve certain ways of thinking. Maybe we should move forward from that and create our own – you know, world, not just rely on how things have always been and tradition and all that stuff. You know, a lot of people are so, oh, I'm a traditional yeah. kind of guy. Usually what it means is I don't want to change the way I live. I don't want to change my life. I don't want to do anything that's going to change what I'm used to. I embrace change wholeheartedly. I love to learn new things. I love to meet new people. I love to have my mind change on a lot of things. Just because I feel that's how you achieve real freedom is when you have the freedom to change your mind. Yeah. There's, you know. And a lot of people just get defensive. Other people say, you know what, let me think about this. I know it's a good argument. You know, yeah, I'll change. Um, well, you know, and, and I think the conservatism that's worth hanging on to is the, is the part where they say, hey, you know, let's stop and think about how we're going to spend our money. I mean that that's the part of conservatism that's like, yeah, that makes sense. I, you know, that I, I, I totally can agree with that. You know. Yeah. So we like Clive Barker. He is a gay author. Um, I've had, you know, situations where people, you know, have been homophobic and they've they've talked about things that they don't like. And and I'm like, you know what? I think being a Clive Barker fan as a teenager really tuned me into the idea of, you know, the other and, you know, yeah. Being open-minded about things. Yeah, just the, reading the books of blood and in the hills, of the city. You're like, oh, this is a, a squabbling gay couple, and the fact that they're gay is not the subject of the story. It's just part of the backdrop. Yeah, you know, and and and, 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 it, and that that to me was like, oh yeah, you know, this is a this is not, this is, this can be just a normal thing. 
Yeah. And still about Candyman, there's a lot of people out there who just keep bringing up, you know, things about Jordan Peele or things about the the way that yeah. the story is being used or that, oh, they turned this into a black story, but this is written by a white man. And it's it wasn't about being black to begin with, but it's like you have to understand that this story has moved beyond what it was in the Books of Blood, even though yeah. in the Books of Blood, it does have that component. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to yeah, some and extent, the, the Books of Blood story is short, and um, and it's and it's about the power of urban myth taking mm-hmm. life, and and it's it's um, it's a kind of a way that that Neil Gaiman and Clive Barker can be similar sometimes is is this idea that belief gives power to these uh, deities or or creatures. Oh yeah, I mean that comes from all the way from like religion and the power of prayer, right? Yeah, yeah. Like if you pray enough for something, mm. then it will happen. And, uh, you know, that's why lots of people praying for their finals. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, please, God, let me pass this final. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, just because you want it really badly, sometimes that doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to get it. But yeah, um, yeah, that's a great point. And um, the forbidden in the books of blood. Sure. Clyde Barker is not black and Daniel Robitaille was a character, uh, expansion by Bernard Rose. Yeah. Um, And and you could even say that that's like the American candy man, or that's like one aspect of this candy man, uh, deity or whatever. Right. You know, that is, here's one of the stories. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and Candyman is sort of a god of urban myth. And, sure. And here's the this this one story of this, you know, slave that that uh, that fell in love with a, a white woman. You know, or yeah. you know, former slave, or and ended up being lynched because of that. Yeah, um, yeah. Is I it, think it's a great expansion on the Forbidden Story, just yeah. like Clive Barker expanded on. The Hellbound Heart when he made Hellraiser. Like yeah. the story is different. Uh, the characters are different. He just ha- evolved them into something else that became yeah. more successful as a movie. Yeah. Uh, like Pinhead. Pinhead is not in the Hellbound Heart. And if he is, is just mentioned as this one androgynous creature with like pins, Jewel bejeweled pins. pins. Yeah. yeah. Right. And the and, female Cenobite was the one that did most of the talking in the, in the, the book. Right. And then he just kind of evolved those characters into actual actor roles. And uh, and of course, you know, gave them a lot more backstory in comic books and films and, you know, Scarlet Gospels and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, there was definitely an evolution of that, just like there was an evolution of the Candyman in The Forbidden towards Candyman in the movie. Um, so it's not exactly the same, but I think... I, I'm one of the guys who thinks that, hey, you know, what they did for uh, – Bernard Rose did for the movie actually improved the story to me. It made it a little – it made yeah. it richer. Uh, it made the character uh, something that you can actually – because let's be honest, just a character that shows up that's very vague, that's undefined, that just shows up whenever – it's going to be different for everybody. It's not an easy way to put on film. But yeah. when they crystallized it on on Tony Todd's performance – and gave it a little bit of a backstory. Not a lot, you know. The yeah. first one doesn't have a lot. The second one has a lot more backstory. But um, I, I thought that was a welcome addition to to the, uh, the reimagining, to the adaptation of the story. Well, so I'm and, willing and to think, welcome the adaptation they're doing for this one. And I think in the first Candyman, it wasn't even 100% sure that that was the real backstory of Candyman. And, right. you know, it was just like, well, you do you do know the story of Candyman, don't you? And it was just a story they told at the dinner table. And, yeah. And it's that that and so it fed into that original uh, idea from the sh- short story that Candyman is urban legend and and, uh, you know, sort of a boogeyman. Right. And he could uh, have multiple backstories. I mean, like if you go between Candyman one and two, why is Candyman in Chicago? You know, in Cabrini Green, and uh, but then in in uh, why are where his ashes spread over Cabrini Green? It doesn't make any sense, right? If you look at the second movie, the whole thing takes place in New Orleans, right? Yeah, yeah. Louisiana, uh huh, yeah. right? And, well, and you, know. you you can and you can justify that stuff by saying, well, he's urban myth and and he's a he's a legend, yeah. So, yeah. so it doesn't matter if the stories are true; it matters if people believe them. 
take those uh, stories with a grain of salt. Yeah. So we'll see what happens with this candy, man. I'm excited. I'm just yeah. not sure if movie theaters are even going to be open this year. It's just, it's just, um, it's hard. Do you think that movie theaters are going to be open in September? Oh gosh. Yeah. Right. We've got a date now. September 25th is the release date. Yeah. And September and I don't... doesn't seem that far away anymore. I mean, the, the, this, this virus is slow. Uh, the, you know, the, 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 the way we're dealing with it and everything, it's it seems like it's not going to go away so fast anymore. Yeah, and and right now America is one of the countries where it's actually picking up again, and yeah. Texas and Florida are closing things again, and it's just terrible. Like th- nobody knows what the hell they're doing. Yeah. Uh, other countries have put this, you know, behind them, and 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 not totally behind them, but they've done a good job lowering the curve. And we're picking up speed. We're just going way up there. It's like it's it's actually like forty five degrees going up. Yeah. And it's 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 uh, scary. Like just um, a restaurant around the corner from me. Uh, five employees were just uh, d- tested positive for COVID, and they were uh, restaurant employees. So that restaurant is now closed down again. And um, yeah. Wow. So. <sighs> You know, we have did we only, open too soon? I don't know. We have only like 150 cases in Fairbanks. So things are pretty much back to normal other than, you know, if you want to wear a mask, you know, probably like a quarter of the people you see in a grocery store are wearing masks. You know, I do. But yeah. but uh, it's sort of optional, and people are treating it like it's over, and then cases are starting to rise again, but not on the scale that they do in other states. I know, man. It's it's complicated. Personally, I'll believe it when I see it, that the cinemas will be open in September, because that's yeah. just two months away. And even if it is, I don't know what this heralds for box office hits, you know, for box office in general for movies. Because yeah. are you going to go <laughs> to a movie theater to watch a movie in September when things have still been, I mean, probably oh, you will. Because, point. That's a good point. Even if they're yeah. open, does it, do, you know, are people going to feel comfortable going? Yeah. So that's, that's a big uh, if. And um, I know a lot of movies have been premiering and streaming platforms uh, it's actually been working better than a lot of people think. Like I'm working from home and I should be working in a building, but yeah. you know, I brought my computer home and I brought everything I needed and I'm working from home, which is pretty comfortable. I'm not going to lie. Uh, you get to, you get to have your cat on your lap. You get to, you know, <laughs> yeah. walk away from your desk whenever you feel like, as long as you get your job done. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty good, but yeah, I don't know what's going to happen in September. Let's hope for the best. Uh, yeah. I'm sure that even though the box office might suffer, hopefully that that is secondary to how how good a movie that is. So yeah. um, I'm looking forward to seeing it, whether it's going to be in the movie or it's, whether it's going to be on a Netflix or an Amazon or whatever. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, you know, or or sometimes. So there there have been some movies where you pay like some crazy amount like 20 bucks and you can stream it from like iTunes or whatever you know at the same time mm-hmm. as it's in the theater I remember seeing um, what was it oh Troll Hunter I think I, I yeah. watched that on an airplane that way it was one of those that was in the theaters at the time and you could pay a larger amount of money to download it and watch it and I watched it on a plane or something um is that that movie from Scandinavia that yeah, uh, is like yeah. found footage? Right. So it was probably a, it was probably a year old by that time anyway, because by the time it hit like U.S. theaters, yeah, I think it had so. To get localized with with subtitles and stuff. Right. Right. So um, yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah. But you you know what you can watch right now. <laughs> You can watch the new configuration boxes, the Brass Bushido video by Little Spark Films. Yeah, and I, and I'm jealous of all of you people in the future and on Sunday because it's Saturday right now, and I guess it's not out yet. For, it's not out yet for us, uh, but it will be tomorrow as of the airing of this podcast. Yeah. So 
it's going to look really awesome. It's one of those configuration boxes, um, and it's it's going to be. I've seen a little bit of 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 the the teaser trailer that they did for Hellraiser Laments, and there's like a couple of people fighting with katana swords. So that, I'm excited for this one. Yeah, yeah, um, and this is one of the ones that wasn't. So this is the first one that they've released now that wasn't previously released, right? So. Yeah, uh, this is a this is a brand new one as far as like uh, previous publications of uh, little. Uh, yeah, uh, nobody's seen this until <laughs> yeah. until Sunday uh, today. <laughs> yeah, today in the future. Yeah. So yeah, go check it out. Uh, uh, send them some comments their way. Little Spark Films on Facebook. Little Spark Films on on uh, YouTube, and uh, we'll have a link for the show notes right there at the bottom of the blog post. So go click on it and check it out. Yeah. And, and, uh, Catalina had brought up at some point that people were, there were somebody commenting, Oh, these are just commercials. It's like, nah, you could say that about us too. Right. I mean, the Clive Barker podcast are just advertising for Clive Barker. I mean, they do it because they love it, not because they are getting paid a bunch of money to, to make advertisements. Yeah, it's still there's still a lot of production value. There's still yeah. a lot of visuals going into it. There's a vision. There's a little mini story for some of those. So, you know, yeah, go check it out. And in other a little Spark Films news, they've released their key art or poster art for the Torturer, and it's this kind of uh, scary looking, brutal uh, artwork of of uh, Paul T. Taylor with kind of a really messed up looking, you know. Like his cheek is removed, and it's kind of yeah. yeah you have to see it, um, but we'll have a link to that also in the it's show notes. Lovely poster art by Anthony Galatis. Yeah, and it was posted by Paul T. Taylor on June thirty, and I think he he, he jumped the shark a little bit there, but uh, it's finally out. Uh, yeah, and let's jump the gun. You you re- yeah, you, you keep uh, confusing jump the shark with jump the gun. So what does jump the shark mean? Jump the shark is from Happy Days when the Fonz jumped over a shark, and that's when the the series was ruined after that. Fonzie Fonzie jumped over a shark. Yeah, on water skis. Whoa! Yeah. So there. So so jumping the shark is the moment in a TV series when uh, when the shows when everybody stops watching because it becomes terrible. Okay. All right, so jumping the gun is when you anticipate something before it was yeah. actually supposed this, to. Yeah, okay. this, like the starter pistol in a race, right? If you if you start running in your race before the gun happen, before the gun goes off. Yeah, the starter gun. Got yeah. it. Anyway, so creepy as fuck poster for the torture. Uh, Paul T. Yeah. Taylor says this is me after some bad dental work, and <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Good, good looking poster. I think this is going to be what they're going to use from now on. Um, and I've got a for, Facebook link to that poster for right now, but maybe we, I could change that to the off of their website or something. Oh yeah, so it's legendary artwork, really cool. Anthony yeah. Galatis, he's he, we've shared him on our uh, Barker Cast Facebook page a yeah. few times because he sometimes makes stuff about Hellraiser and Cenobites and stuff. So yeah. he's a great, great artist. Go check it out. Give him a like on his Facebook page. And uh, again, let Little Spark Films know what you think about the poster. Yeah. And and I, I'm I'm still kind of nervous and scared to watch this movie. It, it's torture is just sort of a... It's pretty intense. Yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, th- that's a good compliment to these guys, the independent filmmakers that, you know... That at least from the previews, this looks scary enough that it's making me nervous about watching it. It's going to be brutal. Yeah. The main thrust of our of our uh, news today is uh, Phil and Sarah from Clive Barker Revelations, uh, ClivBarker.info website, just released their revelatory interview number 34, um, which these have been fewer and fewer uh uh, coming out over the years, mm-hmm. but um, but it, it was a long interview, and Clive talks about a bunch of stuff in it. Um, you know, he goes, uh, he he talks about uh, things that he's working on. He talks about his health. He talks about uh, what's going on. You know, what's going on in his life, and um, he talks about 
poems, and and he's give, he even gives a, a, some movie recommendations at the end. But one thing I thought was really cool uh, at the very start, he uh, he talks about how how teachers have been wanting to teach the thief of always, and he says, "Yeah, man, I miss." Uh, I miss doing that, you know, because of his health. He hasn't been any, any he mentioned Peggy O'Leary and her her uh, curriculum for for Aberat. And he misses being able to 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 talk directly to the kids and and uh, do that stuff, which is that's awesome. And the bears, the the bears, what? <laughs> the Kodiak bears, right? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> I was just Co- joking. Co- yeah. Co- Kodiak yeah. Middle School on. Yeah. In Alaska, yeah, uh, yeah. It seems like um, Phil and Sarah do say that there's been a phenomenal number of teachers uh, who have been um, asking for one-time licenses to continue reading and teaching *The Thief of Always*. That yeah. that would have been awesome for me as a kid to yeah. to do a, a class where you'd be studying Clive Barker because this book is just so amazing. It's got so many cool illustrations. And it's just such a beautiful story. I wish that I hope that a lot of people will go into this. A lot of kids will go into this as being one of the first books yeah. that will um, that they will read and analyze. It's a great start. Yeah, um, and I think you and I were just a little bit too old for that to have been for any teacher to have considered teaching it. You know? Oh yeah, I mean the year after this. A couple of years after this book came out, I was in college. So yeah, yeah, exactly. This um, came out in ninety one, and I graduated in like ninety three. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think I graduated in ninety four. Um, but um, it's a it's an excellent book. I I hope that the teachers teaching this book are good teachers because sometimes if you have a bad teacher, it can drive you off of reading a certain book forever. <laughs> Uh, just because sometimes when you have to do it for school, it just completely kills that enthusiasm that you have for the book. Mm. Um, yeah, I had a I had a teacher for Portuguese in school. He was a really old priest, and uh, he just he just didn't make us excited about this. It was all about formulas and analysis and uh, you know cold clinical analysis of the text. And it just completely turned me off the book that we were trying to read. So I hope that in this case, since they seem to be professors with excellent taste in books, that they will be able to convey the excitement and wonder of the book to their students. I think Conrad's Heart of Darkness was one like that for me. Uh, studying it in college, it was so dense. And the print was so tiny and, and just huge blocks of description and stuff. And I just couldn't, I don't know, I just couldn't get into that one. It's actually a short book. I read that book from Penguin Classic. Yeah. And uh, I didn't have to study it. Uh, so to me, it was a really interesting read. But yeah, like I said, sometimes it depends on how the teacher teaches it. Yeah. Uh, it can just turn you off a book completely. But, you know, that's great that these, just, like I said, these teachers are obviously you know, trying to do the best for their students and direct them to really awesome stuff like Clive Barker. So yeah. I'm sure that they'll be able to convey that enthusiasm and uh, direct them to reading interesting, fantastic fiction. Yeah. One aspect of this interview, I guess, that uh, that was brought up, you know, we it's not something that we ever really talk about much because we try to focus on the positive things. But, you know, his issues with uh, former Seraphim employees, um, we really all all we can say is that the whole thing is sad for everybody involved. Yeah, well, he goes through the struggles that he's had in the last few years, and uh, the position of vulnerability that he felt he was, um, and for a long time physically, and uh, and and maybe mentally, I would dare say a little bit. But mm-hmm. the 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 point is that uh, Clyde Barker has been back for a long time now. He's back. Uh, it's been like, what, when did we see him in the Texas Frightmare weekend? Oh, uh, it's 2017. Yeah. So it's been three years that Clyde Barker has been like hard at work and he's been, you know, with a renovated enthusiasm and he feels like his strength is returning. I think the last revelatory interview, the 33rd was when he was saying, you know, basically announcing to the world that, hey, listen, you know, I, people have been thinking that I've, you know, been in this dark place, but I'm actually back. I've been back for a while. I've been, you know, hard at work. And uh, he wanted people to know that he's happy to come back and meet his fans again. 
sad that now because of COVID that a lot of conventions have been canceled, but, uh, yeah. 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 Right. Right. You know, so now, now he's, I mean, he, he did go to a lot of conventions already in the last couple of years, but, uh, but you know now his his health is his health is better and he's like okay I'm ready to go and and uh, COVID's kind of shut these things down. Yeah, uh, something I was surprised to hear was that uh, he talks here that he had a second coma, that he had a first coma eight years ago, the 2012 one where he had that toxic shock thing from the dental work, yeah. and then they talk about a second coma and that he was ill and the recovery took a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and strokes in between there too. Yes. You know, it's scary, um horrifying and and um with conventions even in the best of times you get really sick <laughs> from going to conventions, right? I mean, yeah. I cannot imagine, I mean going to one now. I mean, they don't exist. They're all shut down, but you know, you'd be pretty much guaranteed to get COVID. If Con, yeah. Con crud. Yeah, yeah. Con crud was a thing even before COVID, yeah, right? Yeah, so that's what I, yeah, right. People always said that uh, you go to a convention, there's a lot of people there. It's usually in the basement of a hotel or whatever. Yeah. And you have panels with hundreds of people just sitting. You know, you remember when we went to see in Texas Friday Night Weekend, that uh, session where they were playing all these trailers and short films yeah. and uh, and basically it was elbow to elbow and people standing on the aisles and standing in the back of the room yeah, and, and the chairs no were chairs. just like little folding chairs. Yeah. And, so and you couldn't see over the heads of the people in front of you to see the screen even. <laughs> yeah. That happens when you have a pyramid head in front of you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But Clive has been hard at work uh, for a long time, even when he was kind of like uh, more room bound, bedroom yeah. bound. He has some pictures of his uh, workroom, uh, as usual, a big mixed up mess of brushes, colors, markers, paints, yeah. uh, crayons, paper. Uh, and he had said yeah. everything that he's done uh, in the past few years has had to be done right there in that bedroom because he needs to be able to lie down. He's done. He's written stories. He's made over 300 different drawings and paintings in his bedroom. And um, he's still very much excited. The, the the things are still flowing out of him, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and one, a couple, there were a couple of his announcements uh, I mean, first of all, I guess the the, um, the he, book of short stories, right? And, and kind of like a, another book of blood, but it's not going to be called that. Um, but the idea was to put together a, a book of short stories that people haven't had gotten a chance to read, you know, or a lot of people haven't gotten a chance to read, which is something I'd been kind of hoping for for a long time. You know, you talk about like, one of my like stories like coming to grief or pigeon and teresa these ones that were published in these these limited time anthologies that are out of print you got to go find them in a used bookstore or something yeah i mean this is something that's been in the back burner that Clive's talked about for over 20 years now uh, yeah. that he wants to collect these stories and stuff and you know it used to be a second books of blood and then it was supposed to be Scarlet Gospels, uh, yeah. and then it was supposed to be Black is the Devil's, Black is the Rainbow. Devil's Rainbow, Yeah, and then it was Tales of a Journeyman. I, I, it's been in the back burner for a long time. Um, and then he they, talks, they did make one. Seraphim made one that was uh, the, the body book, right? Uh, or Tonight Again. Tonight Again, Tales of Love, Lust, and Everything in Between. Yeah, that was more like a kind of a little poetry kind of thing. But there were yeah. there are a couple of short stories in there. Yeah, it was a so, mix of yeah short stories and poetry. It's a um, lovely little book, and they did uh, collect the tortured soul stories into a release. They, they've they've um, and the, they've in, made Infernal Parade also. Infernal Parade and Chiliad. I think there's a part of the interview where Clive talks about that he thinks it's time to 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 release the tortured souls into this collection and Chiliad. and I'm like well those have already been out Clive that, that's a couple of little hardcovers there for those but yeah. uh, I think what he means is that they're very limited uh, releases I mean they were like what 300 uh, 
copies of yeah. some of those? I'm not sure. Right, but they're yeah. they're like little small uh, limited release hardcover publications. Even though some of those are available as Kindle books for anyone who wants to buy them. I yeah. mean, I do have the Tortured Souls on, on oh, really? Kindle. Yeah. So it is available for, for a, a bigger audience through those platforms. Well, that's but, cool. Yeah. yeah. But he does, does say some uh, announcements. He's what he's working on. You know, there wouldn't be a revelatory interview without Clive announcing some projects that he's working on, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and and for me again, that that just to be able to see like Pigeon and Teresa, the coming to grief, um, Hermione and the Moon, you know, those kind of short stories that are rare, and you have to really hunt them down. Uh, oh, and he mentions the Nightbreed Chronicle stories too. Yeah, right. Because he said, I don't even know if that's still in print, and it's not. That that Titan Books. Uh, Nightbreed Chronicles has been out of print for years, and when Occupy Midian started, the 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 resale price on that thing went through the roof. Yeah, it sure did. And but you know what I got out of this? I got out of this that he's excited about Nightbreed again because yeah. he's thinking about re-releasing those Nightbreed stories. Because yeah. for a while there, he was a little. You know, miserable when he thought about Nightbreed, the movie. Yeah. And the fact that he's excited about releasing these stories tells me that he's pretty excited about the, the whole idea of, of the, that world, you know. I think that would be neat to have that collected also in that book. Um, Nightbreed Chronicles was a way better book than Hellraiser Chronicles. but it, Because it seemed to me that Hellraiser Chronicles was really just a promotional book for Hellraiser 3. And it didn't have Clive Barker's stories in it. Yeah, there were no backstories in it. That's yeah. true. It was more visual, more about special effects, yeah. more about sh- the showcasing the Cenobites and stuff and, and displaying yeah. uh, posters from previous Hellraiser movies. But it was still a good, a, a wonderful collectible to have in your collection. Yeah. And then the other thing that he talked about uh, working on was a book of poems called The Presence of This Breath, which is, that's the name of one of the poems in there. And they, and in this interview, you really should go in and read it. And we've got a link in the show notes uh, because they go through that poem and talk about the lines and, and uh, they, they talk about his, um, you know, his development of the poem. They do a little bit of analysis right, right there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it seems like he's working on this book. Uh, he says, the third thing that I'm doing at the moment is, uh, he, the first thing was the Books of Blood 2 kind of collected stories. And then the second one is Scare Baby, which I don't know if you want to talk about that a lot. But uh, oh, the third right. thing is the the Book of Poems that he's editing with Paulo Lorca. So the name sounded familiar. And of course, Paulo Lorca was the guy who was working with Clive about seven years ago. If you can remember the, the Clive's Deviant Art and stuff, uh, they were releasing these little um, little vignettes. Uh, Clive Barker's Alphabet, remember that? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Where where they had little um, little kids uh, for each letter, and for example, O was for Otto, who had a thirst hard to slack. Thus, Otto got blotto and drowned in a lake. <laughs> yeah. So, that was one of those. Um, that was for O. I don't know how many of these they did, or even yeah, if they completed everything. Yeah, and there was somebody everything. that was eaten by owls, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. So there was A was for Abel who fell under a train, and then B is for Brian who had worms of the brain. Oh, jeez. C is for Klaus who was born with no bowels. And D was for Dimitri, who was eaten by owls. There so they go. all kind of like rhyme with each other, yeah. which is uh, it's pretty cool. I think I, I found some of these someone collected on a blog, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put this in the show notes here okay. right now. Yeah. But so yeah, so apparently he's working on this book of poems, which is again something that's not really a big announcement. He's been talking about this for a while. It just uh, it just kind of fell off the back burner there for yeah. And Six we, or seven we years. might actually have a, a blog post about that, too. I can't remember. Oh, since we're, yeah. you know, since we edit this, I can go back and look <laughs> and see if we do. Yeah. Let me check. Clive Barker cast. I'm going to look for Alphabet. This looked like it was a really fun project. I don't know why they didn't finish it. Oh, yeah. here it is. 
Okay, let me go back on the record. Okay. Hey, I found it. It's Clive Barker's Alphabet Poem, and I think we shared this on January 28, 2016. So oh, it was four years ago. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. Wow. So, um, so that – so uh, – Paulo Lorca or Paulo Andreas Lorca was uh, was helping Clive with that, and now yeah, he's, he's an artist, and now he's helping him put together the uh, book of short stories, book of poems. Oh, the book of poems. Okay, that's right. So uh, I'm looking forward to that because Clive Barker's poetry has always been fascinating. Uh, we got a few tastes of that. In, in stuff like Weave World, um, yeah. that's the first time I, I got in touch with Clive's poetry. From Lemuel Lowe's Orchard to other books that he made little poems in. Um, and then, of course, Aberat. Um, and, yeah. uh, and for the um, first time that these books will be pulled out of those. I, I mean, I guess there was the essential Clive Barker. I don't know if that pulled poems out. And there was... Um, Forbidden Flesh, which had the pictures of David Armstrong, and he he wrote poems for that, too. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, he's been working on that. Yeah. It's, it's great that Clive is working in poetry. I think I, I, I would love to be have a time machine where I could go back in the future a few years and then come back and say, yes, that book came out. So hopefully yeah. it will come out. And uh, then they go into – the interview is pretty extensive, right? They, they, they branch out and talk about other things that Clive likes. They, they, they go into discussing movies. They go into discussing music. They go into discussing theater. He talks about the Art 3. Yeah. Uh, says that the Art 3 has been, has been begun for rather longer than I want to own up to. I've collected, you know, those big plastic boxes, bucket kind of things I have in my house – There's a lot of them. Well, I have four of those filled with art ideas. The problem with me has never been having an idea. The problem with me is finding time within the structure of my life to exploit those ideas and explore those ideas. And you know what will happen eventually? Uh, When I fell ill and I was in bed for such a long time, I had to do some serious conversations with myself in which I said, well, I'm not going to write everything that I've got in my head, so why don't I just try to dial down those voices? So there aren't more of them. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You've seen that it doesn't work. A small example of that would be the poetry in the sense that you've seen that I continue to make poems throughout the time I was ill. So he's trying to say that he was trying to downsize his output and it just doesn't work. Um, Yeah. Yeah, And I think the problem with Clive is just it's just a publication problem, right? It's just a way of getting that stuff into published form, into edited form and finally out there as a book. That's always been Clive's problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he has so many ideas all at once that it's hard to it's hard to get them all out. And and committing to a five part series like Aberat is hard, you know. Or or earlier committing to three part series of of Cabal, yeah. Um, or the the art, right? I mean, that's what it, people love those books so much that it, you know they want their sequels. And but you know, some new idea comes along. Like even in Aberat, right? We had. Uh, we had Mr. Be Gone come out right in between Aberat 2 and 3. And now, yeah. now between 3 and 4, we've got Deep Hill is kind of doing that same thing. You know, and I guess we can talk a little bit about it. I mean, you can read in the in in the interview or if you're listening to us, you know, you can you can go back and read what he says about why uh why he had to get rid of Scare Baby and start it over as Deep Hill. But he did, and and I think did he say that Deep Hill was on its final draft? Uh, he says that he says Deep Hill is now in its last draft. The usual Barker thing, you know, three drafts. It's very hard for me to access what's going on with Deep Hill without accessing yeah. what happened to Scare Baby. Deep Hill began as an attempt to bring Scare Baby back into my corner, but you know, then he goes on from there. Um, and. So, yeah, last draft for Deep Hill. I have almost no idea what the book is about. Yeah. I had no idea what Scare Baby was, apart from the fact that we made a April's Fool joke about Scare Baby once yeah. in our blog that had people calling us and telling us, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's like, no, that was an April Fool's joke. But, um, yeah, and he, so he's working on that as well. And he's been working on, oh, from what he says in the interview, on the last two Abrat books. Yeah. So he says yeah, he talks about he talks about five more than he does about Aberat four in this interview, which is really interesting. 
Yeah, wasn't four going to be uh, Cree or Kier Rising? Yeah, yeah, right, uh, Cree Rising. And K-R-Y. I, yeah. I yeah, wonder what's going on with that. Yeah, yeah I know, and he, but he talks a lot about Abrat 5 in this book, you know, like he's he's plotting out the end of the series. So yeah. hopefully that means that Abrat 4 is, is uh, much closer to publication. Well, he says here that Dabrat 4 needs one more draft, otherwise it's finished. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah. So and it sounds to me then like Deep Hill is probably going to come out first before Aberat 4. Right. I, I, that's, that's, that's the way I'm interpreting that. I mean, who knows, but, uh, but we'll see. Your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. And then after that, they go on and talk about they talk about poetry and some you know movie recommendations and and uh, they talk about theater. The Imaginer series. Yeah, they do. They talk about the Imaginer series, which was which was neat to see. Uh, we've been uh, we've been focusing a lot on the Imaginer series this uh, this year of the podcast. Yeah, thank you, Phil and Sarah, for the books and yeah. uh, for helping us complete this. Uh, Please let Clive know that we're working hard on this Imaginer series. Uh, would love yeah. to know what he thinks about that. Uh, it's been getting a very good response from our listeners. And, of course, with Marcus, who's one of the biggest Clive Barker art collectors that I know. And uh, he's always bringing such great insight to to the discussion of, of Clive Barker's art. And I think Clive would be really happy to to know about the Imaginer series that we've been covering. So let him know. Yeah. Oh, they talk about quotes. And he brought up this thing again about, you know, pick choosing quotes for the beginnings of books. And he and he talks about how the ones in the quotes in Cabal were a fake. And he Mm -hmm. said he did that one time and he's never been able to go back and do it again on any other books to create these fake quotes. And and Phil and Sarah said, like, well, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, once you tell a joke, you don't want to keep telling it over and over again. Or it's that kind of feeling. And he said, yeah, I I can see that. I mean, that's paraphrasing, but. Aberat has fake quotes, but they're inside the world of the Aberat. So they're in world. Right. It's it's a little different from from. a quote that kind of is like, oh, yeah, I'm going to pretend like I knew who that was. So, you know, uh, the the cabal ones. Right. Yeah. Right. So and then they talk about some of the art that they've been selling through the website and they discuss the idea of having these. Um, oh, sort certi- of certif- certificate of authenticity. Yes. The certificate yeah. of authenticity that that he's thinking about adding to the paintings right. and drawings sold through the website. So that's a good idea. That gives it more provenance yeah. and that gives it a little bit more uh, pride of ownership saying, hey, I got this from Clive Barker Archive, you know, great artwork. And here's something that states that, yes, Clive Barker sold this and the artwork is verified as one of Clive Barker's artwork. And uh, it, it would have like a little small picture of the the painting itself with some information like title, you know, year, all that stuff. And then I don't know if these would be signed by Clive, but that's a great idea. You know, I think that would really add to the happiness of the collector buying these artworks that they would have something that would attest to their veracity and to their provenance. So, yeah, if you want to, if you want to um, authenticate your Clive Barker original artwork, um, I suppose then uh, they're talking about, doing that um so you would you know keep watching uh revelations clive barker dot info uh to yeah. see to see if that if that becomes a thing they they go on talking a lot about poetry they talk about from william butler yeats to a a milne yeah uh, yeah yeah again like, talking about quotes and i liked yeah. that that uh that uh poem about uh how the teddy bear doesn't get any exercise and the only exercise he gets is when he falls off the abdomen, but then he doesn't have enough strength to get back up again. Yeah. And Clive <laughs> does mention that when Phil and Sarah visited visited him back in 2014, that he couldn't even get out of bed to, 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 you know, to go up to them and say hi. Yeah. So I guess Clive did go through a lot of, of sickness there. So we're glad that he's back and um, hopefully He'll be back doing conventions and, and, and releasing books. Right. Well, who knows what conventions are going to be like in the near future? I mean, I guess that's all up in the air for everybody. But it's yeah. good to see that Clive Barker's health is, is uh, getting back. Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. It's great to see him like talk about stuff that he's still, you know, pumping out, you know, drawings, poems. He has projects that he wants to to complete. Uh, it's great to know that Aberat is on his last draft and that Scare Baby or uh, Deep Hill is also um, on its the last draft as well. And yeah, that's that's good stuff. And it looks like Phil and Sarah have been visiting him very often. And sometimes they're in the next room next door, yeah. and they are just working hard, uh, archiving stuff, going through Clive's books, preparing for the next volume of Memory, Prophecy, and Fantasy, right, and just right, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah Help, now helping. that the Imaginer series is over, maybe we'll see we'll see a, the the f- would be it would be the fourth book of Memory, Prophecy, and Fantasy. And more playbooks. I'm really excited about the playbooks. Me too. Those are so those, those are so affordable, and cool. half of them are previously unreleased. Yeah, it's great to read that stuff because it's it's been really uh, a peek through the window to the Doc Company years, yeah. and to texts that uh, I don't know how collaborative they were, but definitely have the the stamp of Clyde Barker's style to it. And um, and at the end, they always bring the the pictures, the behind the scenes photos of the production from you know the late seventies, early eighties, um, which is also amazing to see because there are pictures we've never seen before. Uh, so there's that. It's another another peek into for the Clyde Barker collector yeah. and fan out there. It's great stuff that you get from from uh, from Clyde Barker's past, and uh, of course, you know. That also informs the stuff that he's fascinated with in the present. Seeing Antoinette posting reviews from more current plays has been really cool. So that's pretty cool to see that come up. And and one comment that I had made uh, was if, here in Fairbanks, if I wanted to see a, a Clive Barker play, I would have to get it commissioned myself. And so kind of going back to these, these little playbooks, they're only like $7 or $10. You could get enough copies for all of the, you know, all the players to read and, you know, and, and put together a production of a play. I think you need to also contact uh, Clive's office to, to set something like that up. But uh, yeah, it makes it a, an affordable option. Instead, Definitely. Instead of having to buy like incarnations or forms, forms of, of heaven. heaven. Yes. Uh, these are amazing. Uh, and there's a lot of plays here that are also very, uh, how should I say this? That, that, for example, the magician, right? The magician seems like perfect for a stage play. It's of course, I'm saying this, of course it's perfect. It is a stage play, but it's just, uh, the, there's so much wit and there's so much, um, so much funny comedy in, 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 in the magician, you know the characters are so great. I think it's it's just I would love to see the magician put on stage as a production. Yeah. I would love to see uh, Hunters in the Snow, uh, just because they're they're so fascinating. I would love to see what people would do with those plays. How would they create the sets and how they would choose to adapt the scenes and and all that stuff? Because I was lucky enough to see the history of the devil, which is one yeah. of Clive's longest plays it's probably done in the also Phoenix his, theater. His most well-known, I would think of all of his. Sure. Plays. Yeah. 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 Because of the seeing ear theater, um, dramatization yeah. as an audio play. Um, and it's, it was just such a great time. It was the nearly naked theater. So the actors were all naked, uh, or partially naked. So it was an amazing piece. Uh, I think the director was a, a director called Damon Daring here at the Phoenix Theater, and it was a great time. I had that. I saw that on the same like just a month after I moved to Arizona. So I was like, "What are the odds, right?" I mean, I'm doing the podcast, and here's this play. It was just. It was the same month, I think, and um, I had a great time going there. And I was lucky enough to see a Clyde Barker play being produced in the theater. So I hope that yeah. if you if you have any like reviews or if you have any uh, impressions about plays that you've seen in the past, from History of the Devil to Frankenstein in Love, to maybe even um, help me out here. What's another play that's been produced? Uh, um, Crazy Face, Colossus. Yeah, yeah. I mean. More modern productions. I think it's been oh, pretty much just yeah. Crazy Face, History of the Devil, and uh, uh, Frankenstein in Love. So I'm not sure if Colossus has been done by anybody oh, recently. Yeah. Right. But if you have any impressions about that, if you have any reviews, just put them on the comment below. 
we'd love to read that stuff and we'll share that on Facebook. Well, coming up for us, actually, uh, this looks like it's probably going to be next weekend uh, if we can get everybody together. Uh, we're going to be doing continuing our A to Z of horror commentaries, doing a commentary for E is for Escape, which is the movie Halloween. And we might even continue on the next time to do Halloween 3, uh, just for fun, because it's so different, you know, from the first Halloween. So Happy, happy Halloween, <laughs> Silver Shamrock. <laughs> yeah, it's a joke on the children. The Imaginer series, we'll finish that up with Imaginer 8. And uh, in a couple of months, we're looking at now, uh, we'll be doing Aberat 3. With Peggy O'Leary, probably. Yeah. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She's been dealing with some some family stuff, you know, that's difficult. And so it's like this book came out in 2011. Of course, we can, you know, it does. it's OK if we, you know, move that out a little ways. So that's, that's what we're working on. So um, apart from that, we're all doing as, as, as good as we can. Yeah. Hope you're okay. Hope you're fine. Hope you're doing fine through these trying times. And I hope our podcast helps you go through your weekends with a smile on your lips. And go check out the Revelations interview at ClydeBarkerInfo.com. All right. And this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. You can find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.ClydeBarkerCast.com. We've got an archive of past episodes, news, features, and reviews, along with all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on every other place you can find podcasts. Share your thoughts with us, and share our podcast with your friends. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that's not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.